Hi, this is Rajul Shah from Purple Octopus Art. We are a platform for art and expressive writing in relation to human disease. We firmly believe that art can heal. And today we have a guest, uh, Gustavo Garcia from Miami, Florida. He is an illustrator, an author, and an artist. And he is here to tell us about his collection of portraits called Fite de Rojas. Gus, welcome. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you came to be an artist, illustrator, author, and how you, where does Fite de Rojas come from? Good morning. Hi. Um, well, this piece of work, it, 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 it basically all started with three criteria I set for myself. And one of the things was I wanted to create a piece of work that was large, that would draw you. Second thing I wanted to do was create something that technically had difficulty and you had to execute um, at, a, at a higher level so that people would view it as, and, and be able to connect with it as, as just as art. Then I wanted to create something that would change the viewer, that the viewer would come and then walk away feeling different, having a, a deeper understanding of things. So um, I, it just came to me to use cancer as uh, the event, as as the vehicle, the venue that I was, you know, that I was going to talk about. But you and, have you have a relation to cancer, correct? You have. Um, right. And, and can I you have, talk, just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I have such a strong connection with art in my family that I thought, perfect, I will use my story to tell the story. And my story started long before I was even born. Um, in, in this piece, I talk about all six generations that it, it has touched, okay, going all the way back to my great grandparents and how they've experienced the loss of a child which is something that is very unique and very difficult to deal with. I, I talk about my grandmother who, who lost a mother, which that is, in, in the development of a child, that is so traumatic. It is something that some people, it affects their lives forever. Um, my, as I said, my grand, well, no, my grandmother, lost her life to cancer, leaving my mother at, at nine years old without a mother. Wow. And, I, and I saw my mother deal with that in the sense of her always longing to feel love. It was something that she was always in pursuit of. But one of the things that I learned from my mom in this, in this whole thing with cancer was her approach to cancer wasn't, um, I have to try to find a way not, you know, to survive, to survive this. No, her, her thing was, I need to survive long enough to raise my kids. I don't want my kids to grow up motherless, which is a testament to the love of a mother. Mm -hmm. All mothers have great love for their kids. Now one has escaped. So for her, she put her life second and she put our lives first. And it was something that she prayed on all the time. And I got to see my mother when I was a, you know, a teenager, a young teenager, my mom experienced um, breast cancer for the first time. And it was at a time when women had a 50 chance, 50% 50 chance of survival. Mm. Um, I, I can't imagine what was going inside of her thinking, I cannot believe this is going to happen to me now at this time in my life. She, she was operated and she was beating cancer. And two days, two years later, she got cancer again. Hmm. And um, her surgeries were very severe. She went through chemo, ra radiation, everything. Um, I, 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 as, as a young man, I, she, one day she showed me her scars. I have never seen anything like that. Wow. So, um, uh, how should I say it? It, it, 
as a woman, I can't imagine what you would feel when you are so, um, the scars were so bad, should mm. I say. I mean, it, all her lymph nodes were taken out. Everything was removed. My daughter, who's now in her 40s um, and has been experiencing dealing with cancer, I asked her, did you ever see her, my mom's scar? And she said, I saw them. And she says, I have never seen images like what I saw of people that have had breast cancer and had their breasts removed. Um, but the, the, the beauty of the whole thing was while she re got cancer, even like I said, as, a, as I was a teenager, my mother got to see all her grandkids and built relationships with them. Her, what God gave her was well beyond her expectations. I was in my 50s when my mother passed away. Oh, wow. I mean, all, she had two sisters who both got breast cancer after my mother had her second surgery, oh. and both of them died before my mother. It, so one day my daughter calls me that she's getting lumps in her breasts. Oh boy. And it, one, her, 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 her breast was bleeding. And uh, her doctor said, your dad needs to be checked for, for genetic cancer because we need to know what we're dealing with. Um, so I did, and I carry BRCA1, oh. which is a testament to men who think that Oh, I'm in the clear. I, you know, I could never get breast cancer. No, you can. Uh, one of the doctors had told my younger daughter that, oh, your dad broke the link from your his mother to you guys because he's a man, and it's not true. Mm -hmm. I gave breast cancer BRCA one to my eldest daughter, and it was very hard for me to talk to her about it at first because I felt guilty. She says, no, there's no guilt here. Her approach to it was different than my mother's. Her approach was, I am going to do whatever I can to live my life to the fullest, but also deal with my problems right away. Um, and I say that because right now, she was telling me that there are women that receive their results from their genetic gene test mm -hmm. and they have the envelope sealed for over two years because they're oh. afraid to open it. Yeah. So, so this is something that affects a lot of people. And in this work of art, I wanted to show that we are not alone on this. Okay, we have a lot of support, a lot more than what we can imagine. I didn't know this going into this, but that's what I discovered. So um, if you can share your screen and show us your beautiful work um, and tell us about it. This is, these are all portraits of people and they're, it's a connection of three. Okay. I wanted to show how a small connection of three people can make, uh, how far will this take me? And it literally took out of, I would say about 14 people is how I brought all these people together. The cancer victim, I put him in the center and I made a square of 144 people. I don't know if you can see, but there's little dots in the center, there's four dots that make a square. It's literally a, like a one third of the piece on the inside. There's four dots. Okay. And within all those people that are there, they brought the people that are surrounding them. And all the people that are in that square personally know the cancer victim in the center. Again, I only used a few people of those 143 people to bring all the other people, but that's how I show the connection. And in that connection, I collected six continents, 58 countries and 26 states of the United States. This is a person that hardly even traveled. 
so to say, well, my, you know, my uncle or my brother, you know, they, they, they generally stayed in within their own city or their own, you know, state or it doesn't matter. Our connections go so fast and so deep that it's, it's staggering. And the fact is that those are the people that support you. This is real support and real suffering because these people will pray for you. These people, when they hear of your situation, they are there in, in mind and in spirit for you. So just to, just to make sure, um, to summarize, you're showing the, the connections of people and how you can, you can be one person with cancer yes. or, or any chronic illness. Right. And there'll be people around you, such as your immediate family or your friends and your loved ones. And right. they are wishing you positive thoughts and praying for you. And then they tell their loved ones and friends who may know of may you. Not know you. And so then they are brought into what you call the prayer chain. Exactly. Because and, and then it because just multiplies from there. And so it's saying basically that I know my cousin's brother-in-law's niece has cancer. No, no, not even that far. My brother, my cousin's niece or my cousin's friend has cancer. When you are that close to somebody, you will feel for that person. Yeah. If you find out, if I see you every other so often, I know you personally, I can see how you change, how your your demeanor may be different. You may be feeling something for somebody because they're so close to you. They're like a best friend of yours or a relative. Yeah say what is wrong with you you're going to tell me and i'm going to feel for you because i am human that is a human connection that we feel for each other now if i tell a friend that a friend of mine has a friend or now it becomes more of a story sure there may be a con but the real connection is me you and your relative me you and your friend who i've never met i will feel for that person it's a really beautiful depiction of the power of positivity. Yeah, it's, it's how we are connected in life. So these are the little squares. And you can see the little black. None of the pieces touch. That was very important to me. I wanted to show individuals. I wanted to show them. And that's a representation for me of saying, these people are independent. These people are not, uh, you know, they're not touching. Everyone is them by themselves, but we are still connected, right? Um, and there are 1,296 portraits here. Wow. And when I started this in November of 2009, I was told, how are you going to paint this many people? I had no idea. I had no clue. I just needed, knew I just needed to do it. I set so these out. Are all, so these are all individual paintings. No, there's no, there's no one repeated. These are all individual people. And that connection is real. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it really wasn't it, collecting. The people was difficult, but Painting them took a lot of effort, took a lot of time. And I used it as this is, this is my difficult task, painting this many portraits as, well, when the cancer victim has to go through chemo, it's not a choice. It's, you have to do it and it's not easy. So this is going to be my, how I, I tried to connect with that. That, that difficulty. Well, as 
I have it. I have. I created a sketchbook when I was doing this piece, just for the piece. Wow. And in it, I would write my emotions, my feelings, the things how I would research and try to, you know, develop the piece. And one of the things I wrote in May of 23, I had painted two thirds of the piece by then. Wow. And I said to myself, I was looking at what I was painting. I was seeing all these people. And it hit me that not how many people I had painted, but this many people are affected so quickly and their lives are turned upside down and their families are filled with hurt Yeah, that I couldn't paint. I would, I would get so emotional that I would have to stop because I would start crying and I just could not focus on painting. I would leave. And while I was already within three months, I was already two thirds of the way down done. It took me another three months to finish the last third because wow. I would have to stop, go do something else, come back and just focus on the, on painting, the process of painting and not think about people, not think about what they could be feeling. It, it, that's how impactful this became when I'm looking at the numbers of people. Right. So when it, you, so right. how many years did this take you from start to finish? I came up with the idea in November of 29 in September of 2010, it was up for exhibit. In September of 2010? 2010, yep. And, and it had to be oh. outside, meaning that this piece that was like 13 feet by 13 feet had to be able to have the wind go through it so that it wouldn't go flying in a storm. All these things had to be uh, thought yeah. and, and, and calculated and figured out. Um, I, immediately in November, I called my brother, who's very good at um, building things and creating things. And I said, I need to do this. And we collaborated. And he lived in Michigan at the time. And at the time, I was in Georgia, in Atlanta. And he would start making mock-ups and send them to me. And he actually built the construction of the entire piece. This thing breaks down into 36 pieces and you can build it all over again. Wow. So, so I it, take it to different it, places. So it's an art installation. Correct. Is what we're looking at. 13 right. pieces. And, and I show it all the time. I, I exhibit this for free probably, you know, at least once to maybe three times a year. Wow. Um, just so people can see it and and understand that not only they're not alone when they're dealing with these things, but I really try to stress to people, if you have gone through this, you know, you know what it takes. When you experience something in life, no one can talk about it better than you. Mm -hmm. hey, we go to the gym, we lose weight, we get new clothes, we go to a party or we go somewhere, see, oh, people will say to us, wow, you look great. And we go into the litany of things that we've done to improve ourselves. But we beat cancer and we don't talk about it. And it is something that someone may be experiencing it at the moment and they're starting their dark tunnel. And man, if somebody that has already gone through it goes to them, I know what you've gone, you're going through and I'm here to help you. What can I, how can we meet? How can we keep in touch and push them to know that they can do it? That, that, can, that help, that, that encouragement, that push makes the world a difference. It really does. So, most of the people that I would talk to, because I didn't talk to all of them, but most of the ones I would talk to that had cancer, I would say to them, the cancer victim told me 50% of the battle is within you. And they would say, 
discussed that is 100% right. And some would even say it's even more than that. Mm. You have to want this. You have to fight. You have to fight for your life and know that you're not alone. Well, this definitely um, illustrates the connections and that no one person is alone. Tell me, was there, um, a, did you choose the colors of yes. red and blue? Is there, how did you come to cho choose that? Yeah, what you see here in red is an actual sculpture that resides in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It, okay. is, it was built by Alexander Calder. Uh, it has become the iconic image of that city. They use it everywhere where anything is done by the government, you will see this image. And I use that because that's the town, that's the city. It's medium-sized city. Uh, my parents moved there. My, that's where my mom chose. We knew no one there when we came to this country. And I used it as a symbol of that's where she thought was the best place to raise a family. So that's the symbol that that represents, right? Wow. So tell us about the title, Fite de Rojas. How, how did that come up? Um, how did you come to title this? Yeah, I, you know, as an artist, I find that, you know, sometimes naming a piece is difficult. Uh, how, do, how do you make a connection to the <laughs> name and the piece? Um, growing up, I saw a lot of artwork that was always labeled untitled. Um, and I started playing with names. I started, you know, writing down different names and different things. And then one day I realized, you know, let me make the name not so, not so much like just tying it to the piece, but make it meaningful. I'm going so to... Sorry, I'm just going to ask you to, you can stop sharing your screen. Okay. Um, so that we can uh, see more of you. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So I, 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 na I named it Fita de Rojas. I used the name Fita, with, which was a, 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 the name that my daughter gave my mother. Um, it's, a, it's a name of endearment. So I, I wanted to use something that represented love, but I wanted to use something that represented the future. And that to me was that name. The Rojas is her mother's maiden name, which was the past and which was where it all kind of started from. And going to her, my grandmother's parents. And one day it hits me that my grandmother's parents, they witness their daughter die mm. and as a parent and just last night I was even thinking it is I my daughter's in 40 she is 42 now that is like me losing her what they experience and me losing my daughter or any of my kids it would be so difficult yeah. I can't even imagine what they must have gone through. I was exhibiting this piece two years ago in Hollywood, and a friend, this lady comes up to me, and she goes, do you, do you remember me? And I, oh, wow, oh, somebody that I used to work with in the 80s. And she said, wow, this is, piece is beautiful. She said, I just lost my daughter two years ago. Oh, boy. My God, I, I mean, I, she almost killed me. She said, I have not left my house until today. Two wow. years. That's how difficult it must be for parents. Well, there's that. So I wanted to use those names to make up this name so that it meant something to uh, emotional to the piece. Right? So I, I wrote a long, lengthy poem about it. And it's on my website, Gustavo8.com. If you go to Fita Ross, you can find under it says name, you'll you'll see the poem. You'll even see 
the six generations that this that touch that is touched by cancer, oh, and wow. how they all differently dealt with it. Um, but it's a lengthy poem. I don't want to read the whole thing, but I'll read just a little bit of it. And it, I wrote to name this work. This work of art right was so important to me because the woman in the center was the one who gave birth to me. And I, put, I, I, I labored for months to create this work of art, even though it was her who endured the hardest part. Mm. I pray I did my best in creating this art. I thank God for my mom who lives in my heart. It's it's longer than that, but- um, It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. I, um, it's very, um, I certainly um, can see the emotion and the empathy. And I know, um, a lot of the best artists have the ability to really empathize, but you also seem to go a lot deeper in terms of your connection. Yeah. So, well, one of the things we'll that, see. like I said at the very beginning, I wanted art to change people, right? And um, I chose this, this subject matter, right? When I exhibited this piece in Grand Rapids for the first time, I, I would sit by the, the piece of work and people would just walk up and look at it. So I, I saw people break down in ways I never thought I would, it would get to that. And I started to realize that so many of us carry a lot of pain and mm. we don't, we don't address it. And sometimes something like this, a piece of artwork can open that layer up a little bit and let us connect, but also by trying to connect in a positive way where, hey, my person, the person that I know, their life wasn't in vain. They, they, they meant something to a lot of people. That can make us feel a little bit more comfort, a little bit more whole, okay? I agree, I agree. Yeah. Um. You also write children's books, correct? Yes. Yes. I illustrate and write children's books. Yeah. I I can. uh, How mm -hmm. does. um, Yes. How does that um, relate to your work? As I mean, you're an illustrator, you're an artist, you're an author, and, and it's pretty amazing this. Pita de Rojas is, it's like the ultimate story. Yeah, I'm, I, well, right now I'm working on, on, on doing a book for that piece where I can really share stories of people that I talked to, uh, things that I saw, things oh, that wow. I continue to see and how they work together in this piece. So while it's one piece of work that I'll be showing, but I, I have images of, the construction of the piece from the very beginning. I have sketches that I did of the piece, how I thought it could be and how it changed. Um, And again, I have writings of how I felt at different times during the process, um, different challenges that I would run across and how to overcome them. So I share, I'm gonna share all in the book, but it's it's gonna be like a, a coffee table size book, but it's going to have great images, but it's also going to have good stories. That's, of people. Oh, I can't. When, when do you think that will be published? Uh, sometimes I write and then I <laughs> the can't write. You know how it is, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. but I'm working on it, you know? I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. And I think yeah. that book is going to carry a lot of meaning for a lot of people. Yeah. I think you're One going to the, be. Uh, um, I, man, I can't. I'm not going to look it up right away. But anyways, I, I created a, a, a little cartoon character and I call it Fita the Fighter. And it's actually a 
cartoon character oh. of a poo that has arms and legs. And it it's trying it's trying to show women, like for instance, I have two boobs riding on a on a tandem bike, and it says together we can beat breast breast cancer. Oh. And it's true. Together we can fight this together because we encourage each other to do better. We we encourage hey, you like I said before, you go to the gym. Isn't it easier to go to the gym with somebody else? Isn't it easier to have a personal fitness trainer there to encourage why? Because it works. The same thing with this. If you have somebody that has experienced this and they're next to you and they're encouraging you, you're gonna do much better than if you're trying to do this all by yourself. Don't do it. That's true. Talk about it and get help. And people that have had it, you need to become help. You need to become hope for people. That sounds, and, um, and it's such a rewarding thing for yourself. Yeah. Make a difference in somebody else's life. That's a yeah. wonderful, uh, wonderful take. Yeah, because right? I'll tell you, yeah. when I did this, I was talking to an older lady and I said to her, people don't talk about this. And she said, you know, Gus, when I was a kid, you know how you found out that Uncle Bill had cancer? Bill has cancer. Yeah. In our own families, we didn't talk about it. Yeah, there was definitely a stigma. And actually, in some parts of the world, um, there still is a stigma with breast cancer, especially in some of the Asian cultures. So um, I think this is a wonderful, wonderful piece of work. And I think your book is going to, I think your book is going to reach even more people than you ever dreamed. So Gus, I, I want to thank you for your time today. Well, thank you. And I look forward to more collaborations with you. All right. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you.